Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, whenever you're watching this. Um, welcome to the booth. I am Sean DeRager. If you can't read the, I don't even know if it's on the YouTube channel. Is it down, like, down there? Does this say my name? Anywhere down there? Am I doing this right? Anyway, um, so I'm about to do a little warm up. Figured I'd videotape a little bit for the YouTube thing. I don't know. I don't know if that helps anything, but I'm just, it's fun to do. Uh, up my booth a little bit. All right. All right. I got, a, I got some panels wanting to fall down. All right. So for my warm-up today, I am reading from, of course, I grabbed a paperback from hell off my shelf. Uh... Today's is Heads by David Osborne. Look at that cover. Awesome. I have gotten the uh, I've gotten the bug of collecting these. There's an Etsy shop that they, we I think we're on a first name basis by now. Because I peruse it every day. All right. Here we go. I'm just going to read, eh, get all the fumbles and everything out of my system before I start, <laughs> uh, before I jump into Ammerford, 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 uh, for Zach Brooks, uh, How Not to Be a Scribe. But right now I'm reading the prologue to Heads by David Osborne. Nighttime. The faint smell of antiseptic. The hospital's PA system, a muted whisper in the light-dimmed corridors. Nurses' stations, silent islands. The occasional medical figure, uniform starched white, white shoes, creep sold silent. Huh. St white shoes, creep sold silent. The man in room 203 in the West Wing was dying of cancer of the pancreas, which had spread to his liver. Neither radiation therapy nor chemotherapy had been able to halt the carcinoma's relentless progress. Carcinoma? <clears throat> he had a week to live, at best. And he knew it. This morning he'd been moved to a private room. He was bone gaunt, his hair thinned almost to nothing and lifeless. His skin was yellow and his hollow eyes were dull with hopeless resignation. All afternoon he'd stared out the fading green of September All afternoon he'd stared out at the fading green of September trees on the hospital lawn, wishing it were October so he could see the leaves changing to red and gold a final time. He didn't recognize the doctor when he came in. Nor the woman, apparently also a doctor from her white coat and the stethoscope thrust casually into a side pocket. He'd never seen either before. The doctor pulled a chair close to the bed. He was relatively young and exceptionally good-looking in a lean and masculine way, with deep-set intelligent eyes and a strong face. His manner was quiet. He looked tired and overworked. The woman, also young and looking equally tired, stood back, respectful and attentive. She was slender and quite beautiful, actually, with delicate features and amber eyes, and had tidy and hair swept back into a loose chignon. Dang it. What is that? Chignon? <laughs> All right. The soft aroma, the, <clears throat> the soft aroma of her perfume. Bleh. So you gotta get all these stumbles out before I start recording her. The soft aroma of her perfume reached the dying man. For an instant, his eyes rested on the gentle swell of her bosom beneath her white coat. She was life, where he was death. 
The doctor introduced himself. I'm Dr. Michael Burgess. This is my associate, Catherine Blair. We're with the Borg Harrison Foundation Research Lab in Bethesda. Can we talk a moment? Without waiting for an answer, Michael opened an... <laughs> Michael opened a folder containing biographical information. The dying man had an IQ of 138, a master's degree in social... Anth a master's degree in social anthropology, a doctorate in political science. He was going to leave behind a wife of 20 years and two daughters in their teens. He perfectly fitted their research needs. <laughs> Michael pretended to study the material, although he'd gone over it many times. <clears throat> it was to give the dying man a chance to get used to him. Although, usually, the magic name Borg Harrison put potential volunteers at ease. I think that's me sarcastic. Presently, he said, I know you know how sick you are, so I'll come directly to the point. What would you say if I offered you a better than even chance to live at least another two or three years? The dying man looked back blankly. Michael was used to that. They all did. He said, Do you understand me? We are quite certain we can keep you alive. The hollow eyes flickered with sudden anger. Is this some kind of joke? <clears throat> Michael rose to look out the window. Occasional street lamps made islands of pale light amid the dark shadowed lawns and trees surrounding the hospital. He said, Hardly. Although I have to tell you that you will no longer be mobile. Not the way you are now. Unable to get up and move about. You would have no further uncontrollable... <clears throat> you would have no further uncontrollable pain, however. And you'll be able to keep up with the world. Converse with friends. Read. He smiled and gestured at the silent television set. He smiled and gestured at the silent television set he was certain the man never watched. Share other people's lives? We're running a brain research program in which we'd isolate your body and your cancer from your brain in a neurological blocking process that prevents the cancer from met metastasizing. <laughs> prevents the cancer from metastasizing. There was more, but he usually tried to stop there. With the layman, you had to be careful. You could only go so far. Occasionally, one would ask about food, and he'd tell them they'd receive everything everything they needed through total parenteral, parenteral nutrition. Amino acids, glucose, proteins, minerals, insulin, all dripped into a main artery at the rate of 20 drops per minute. This one didn't ask anything else. He was too concerned with his death. He said, It sounds like medical double talk. But the anger was gone now. The tone different. Was I too angry there? He said, It sounds like medical double talk. But the anger was gone now. The tone different. Michael recognized the change. The patient suddenly wanted to believe. I'm sure it must he admitted. But who knew a few years ago they'd be able to create human life in test tubes? The hollow eyes focused on him again. Okay, but why me as one of your guinea pigs? That's what you're saying I'd be, aren't you? An experiment? There are thousands like me, and you can't have much success. I've never heard of this, and in the last year I've read nearly everything going on. And in the last year, I've nearly read everything going in medicine. Michael knew the speech had taken enormous effort. The man had to feel nauseated, desperately ill throughout his whole body, and numb with the drugs he'd been given to combat the agonizing pain. Talking at all, even... S <clears throat> talking at all, even just saying a few words had to be nearly impossible for him. 
two reasons, he replied. First, we only accept people on the verge of death. Second, the program is limited to under certain governmental security restrictions. Well, hold on. Second, the program is limited and under certain governmental security restrictions. Where you personally are concerned, to be frank, it was pure chance. You came up on a inner hospital computer. For the first time, Catherine Blair spoke. Her, vo her, voice, her voice was softly authoritative. Your chances are over 80% in your favor, if we move immediately. The dying man saw her exchange a look with the doctor. She seemed to hesitate. Well, go on, he said. You may have time. I don't. He wondered fleetingly if, in spite of his professional assurance, the woman might be stronger than Burgess. Her more pragmatic to compliment his more pragmatic to compliment his possibly greater idealism, or perhaps more ambitious. In a quiet way, she almost seemed in charge. Michael said, "Okay, here it is. If you agree to this." You won't be able to see your family again, or current friends, ever. They will have donated, <laughs> donated. They will have donated your remains to science, and they'll be told you died, and will be given a sealed coffin. He got the reaction he always got. Breath held silence. Eyes wide with shock. The thought of immediate and irrevocable, and irrevocable, the thought of immediate and irrevocable separation left all of them as frightened as the. <laughs> the thought of immediate and irrevocable separation left all of them as frightened as de as of death itself. But almost at once he could see some of the blow ebb and a glimmer of hope reappear. Again, from experience, he could guess the dying man's thoughts. Stay alive for another two years, and who could know what might happen? Perhaps finally a cure for cancer. It was exactly what the man was thinking. He glanced at the woman doctor. The smile she gave him was filled with care. He suddenly felt safe with her. When would it happen? he asked. Is it surgery, or what? Some of it is surgery, she replied. She was closer now and put her hand over his. Her touch was cool. And if we do it at all, it's got to be immediately, tonight. You're going to need all the strength possible. And from now on, you'll go downhill like a tobag... Tobaggin! Tobaggin! And from now on, you'll go downhill like a toboggan. Something hard like iron grabbed at his heart. Again, his breath wouldn't come. Or words. Tonight? No. It was impossible. He tried to think. Death was right there. A dark presence just by his head. The awful terror of not being anymore. The black, non-knowing forever. No words could describe. No words could describe it. Every dawn now he poured sweat and stifled screams, and prayed for a coma. He didn't want to know the final moment. He said, "Whenever you want." Michael nodded and took a printed form from the folder. I'll need your signature. He didn't read it. What's the point? Besides, Borg Harrison was a prestigious organization. Its chairman, Admiral, Wa Admiral Walter Burnley, was a friend of the President of the United States. There could be nothing fraudulent or unethical there. Wait, there could be nothing fraudulent or unethical here. <laughs> he scrawled his signature with Michael's pen, boldly, 
because he knew he wasn't defiant. Because he knew if he wasn't defiant, he'd go to pieces. He asked, when will my wife hear? He felt a wave of heartbreak for the past, for what might have been in the morning. You will have died in your sleep. You won't have suffered. In a way, she'll be grateful and happy for you. He felt, he felt the sting of tears. Michael rose. We'll be back in an hour. The warm pressure of his hand, his quiet smile. <clears throat> this author has some like weird sentences. I'm like, uh, that's a sentence. That's the sentence. The warm pressure of his hand, his quiet smile. The door closed behind him and Catherine Blair. Only a trace of her perfume lingered to say they'd ever been there. It was done. Minutes ago, there had been nothing but the black despair of inexorable injustice, the, ine the inevitably, the inevitable, inevitable, inevitability, the inevitability of death. Why? Why him? Now suddenly there was hope. A nurse gave him a shot. He thought of his wife again, her love and courage, hiding her agony. To end her misery tonight was the last thing he could do for her. He thought of his daughters, the lives before them. He'd given up hope that he'd ever know of their accomplishments and dreams. College, young men, weddings, grandchildren. But now, possibly, he would. He stared at the dark rectangle that was the night window of his room. It was as though death had been sent to wait outside. He ceased thinking about others then. He began to think only of himself. He didn't have to die. He might live. He just might. He felt as though a miracle had happened. Pretty soon, some nurses came with a stretcher to take him away. All right, that's the prologue to... Heads! What is going to happen? What is going to happen? Are they going to take his head? I don't know. I've never read the book. I've only seen this cover in Grady Hendrick's uh, wonderful book, Paperbacks from Hell, which you should buy because it's awesome. And, um, <clears throat> and then let's all keep these paperbacks alive. So I want to do, um, speaking of that, I hope to have some cool things to announce for, for next year soon, working on some things, working on bringing more, uh, books like this to audio, which is kind of like, would be like my, I would love to be doing like only that, but, um, I, I want that to be a big part of what I do is kind of narrating these, um, older books. So I got some of that, some things on the burner. And um, right now I'm working on How Not to Be a Scribe by Zach Brooks. And then I'm also working on Gods of the Dark Web by Lucas Mangum. And uh, so those should be out. I'm hopefully, hoping to have them narrated and done by the end of the month, which means probably mid-January or early February they'll be hitting Audible, the way Audible works. And I got to get them, you know, the authors to listen to it and to prove it and has to go through proofing and editing and all that, but um, that's what I'm working on, everybody. So it's been an awesome year. I'll probably do one more of these before the year ends, but I do want to thank everybody for watching and for uh, giving a shit. Um, this has been a, <laughs> a tough thing to kind of try to get, you know, get going on, and I've really had some luck with some of these projects I've gotten, and um and the amount of books on my plate for next year is just humbling. So hopefully I get to all of it uh, as quick as I can. So like many of you know, this is my like my even my second job in a sense. I do have the day job with those responsibilities, and then this is all kind of trying to fit this in around that um, uh, until things make sense for me to you know pursue this full time. But that's a ways away. 
Um, all right, I'm signing off. Talk to all of you later. Uh, track down some 80s paperback books, everybody. Show me pictures of them. And, of course, check out that book, Paperbacks from Hell. And Valancourt has a little label because they put out the Paperbacks from Hell book and then they've been putting out their own... They've been re-releasing some of these paperbacks. Um, so check those out, too. And then, uh, oh, and then Out for Blood should be out, I'm thinking mid-January. Out for Blood will be hitting audio. So that's not it's not technically not a paperbacks from hell on that Valancourt label, but it totally is from 1991. In my book, uh, it's a paper it's a paperback from hell. <clears throat> so, all right, I'm done. I'm done rambling. Thanks for watching.